Welcome everyone to our talk on motion design and how to improve um, user experience with animations. We're really happy to be here. So short introduction. My name is Sarah. This is my co-presenter Lise. We work for Amazy Labs as front-end developers. You'll find our Twitter handles and the CodePen links on the slides. And MAZ Labs is currently hiring, so if after 25 minutes you still think this was pretty cool, come talk to us. <laughs> so here's a small animation we created with GSAP. GSAP is GreenSock animation platform. Um, it's the last for DrupalCon drop logos that evolve into each other using morphing and drawing animations. Lise will show you a bit more in depth and encode how you can do stuff like that. So we're really excited and let's get started. The agenda, as a short intro, we'll show two brief examples how to and how not to do animations. Then invisible and immersive and how that, um, what that means in the context of animations. Then from the 10 top principles, we selected three, and we're gonna explain those three in a, um, a bit. And then the biggest part will be examples and some code. So when we talk about animation that improves the user experience, we are not talking about things like this unholy abomination. I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to watch that and appreciate it. So sites like these are why animation gets a bad rap. That is animating for the sake of animating. Good animation is well thought through and designed. It requires planning and should be part of your development process. So when we talk about animating your site, we mean things more like this. This is an example of a site with immersive animation, which is not as commonly used, but it's a good example to showcase how motion that has been designed can improve the flow of a website and ultimately the user's experience. So immersive and invisible animation. Good animation can be broken down into two groups, immersive and invisible. To briefly explain the differences, immersive animations are things like data visualizations where animation is the purpose. Invisible animation is animation done well as part of a UX flow, it doesn't announce itself. While conventional animation may have 12 basic principles, which were originally defined by Disney in the 1930s, there are many people who believe that this can be consolidated into 10 principles for motion design. I'm quickly gonna talk about the top three principles that Sarah and I have chosen, which we believe to be the most valuable. So squash, stretch, and smears. This gives a, weight, a sense of weight and flexibility. Objects change shape as they move and depending on the, depending on the elasticity of what they're made of. When using this principle, it's important to maintain the volume of an object to make it look realistic. This can have the tendency to look childish, so it needs to be subtle and natural looking. Follow through and overlapping action. Not everything stops at once. This helps give the impression that the character is obeying the laws of physics. And in this instance, the character is whatever object it is that you're animating. Timing, spacing, and rhythm. This is the amount of time it takes for an action to happen and the changes in speed over the duration of an action's timing. This also makes animated objects appear to obey the law of physics and it can establish mood, emotion, and reaction. So enough with theory, let's check out some examples. There will be um, animations that we think are really nice and improve the user experience. And the second part of the examples will be code and stuff that we did, so we go in more depth. Um, that's a page transition, and it shows really nicely on how to keep a user's context. We don't just switch the, the page, or what we clicked on doesn't like suddenly come up from, from above or from a weird side, but we click on it. We know we clicked on the grid, it enlarges, we can follow it with our eyes. We know where we click, we know where we go through, and we know where, we, where it goes back. And on top of helping with UX, it also just looks nice. I mean, if there was no animation, I definitely prefer it. Um, zooming, scaling up. Um, 
Here's an iOS screen opening an app, no transition, no animation at all. Just breaks context, new page. I'm not sure, did I click the right icon or not? Here's the same thing, but with animation. So you know you clicked the weather icon, it grows out of the icon, and you know you're in the right app. That's skeleton screens. Um, the UI incrementally completes on the right side, and both screens take the same amount of time till they load, but the right one just feels way faster, because I start seeing things appearing on top, and the bottom can still load, but also re I already read and see content. Big sites like Medium or Facebook use skeleton loading. A nice contact form, it's pretty playful, so don't use this if you work for a bank or insurance, might be too childish. Um, it also has a lot of context switches, but since the elements move and transition, you can follow it, where it goes, where did it come from, really nice and fluid. Okay, so now we're gonna show some examples where we dig into the code just a little bit. So over here we have a search input field. I just need to get my mouse over here so we can actually use it. Okay. Click. Ah, there we go. Cool. Okay, so when clicked, the search icon morphs into the input field and the text animates in from the top. This is created using GSAP's Morph SVG plugin. Um, let's see, I just want to play it for you again. So this utilizes some of the principles that we spoke about earlier, such as follow through and overlapping action, which makes it feel smooth and organic and like it's obeying the laws of physics. So you'll notice when I open it, the text slides down and then the cross slides in just a little bit after with a little bit of delay. This helps make it feel more organic. So to get into the code, just to give you like a bit of context so you know what we're talking about, over here are some of the variables that were defined. Um, here we've, this is how you create a timeline in GSAP, and here you can see it's incredibly simple, literally saying morph A into B, that's how easy GSAP is. And this over here, you can see um, how we trigger this by toggling the active class and how we make the timeline play in reverse. On to the next example of a share button. So if we click it like that, that's what happens. Okay, so the, one of the important principles or concept, concepts here is that you don't have to show everything all at once. You can reveal things when the user needs it or when the user asks for it. This is also using the principle of squash and stretch. So it's maintaining its volume. So it makes sense that when I, it's a large, I, we've obviously enlarged it for the presentation. You wouldn't actually make it that large on your website. But when you click on it and the other buttons are sort of pulled out of it, the original button gets smaller. So it's maintaining its volume. This example also animates from its origin. So the human brain is saying, that's in there. And we all know there's no there. It's all just code. But it gives a good sense of context for the user. Am I in the right place? Yeah. So to go into the code, this animation is entirely CSS. Um, and it's quite complicated. But I wanted to quickly show you how powerful SAS is, if you really dig into it. Here are some of the variables that have been defined and one of the mixins. Here's another more complicated mixin, um, which this one is used for distributing the social share icons. All of these examples are available on our code panes if you wanna play around with them and dig into them a bit more. And this is the only JavaScript that was used for that animation, which is what's used to trigger the animation on click. So now something quite the opposite. This one is entirely JavaScript. <laughs> probably. Um, so this is the DrupalCon animation uh, that was done using GSAP's Draw plugin, Morph SVG plugin, and Shape Index plugin. It's quite intricate, so we're just going to look at a small part of it. So over here, you can see the, a piece of the SVG code. We've got a path called V1, which stands for Vienna 1, which is that first 
section of the Vienna logo, and D1, which is the piece of the Drupal uh, Con Dublin logo that it morphs into in that section over there. So the D1, that path is actually hidden. It's display none. You will actually never see that, but I'll explain a bit more of that later. Just for some context, here are our variables, and here we've created our timeline. So you'll see I've said repeat negative one and yo-yo true. Repeat negative one is what makes an animation loop in GSAP, and yo-yo true is what makes it reverse, so it'll play through and then reverse back. We also use labels a lot in this animation. So you can use a label to, to make multiple sequences trigger all at the same time, which is what I did. So here we've got V1 and, and D1 morphing into each other. So in the animation at this point, V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 morph into D1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 all at the same time using that label. And then here is how the morph actually happens. So quite simple, again, he's saying, take the path of Vienna 1, you choose your ease, GSAP has got some really great eases, you can also create your own eases. Then you're saying morph it into the shape of D1. And what's important to note here is that you're not making that D1 path visible, you are changing V1's path to the path of D1. So from that point onwards, you will still be targeting V1, it will just look like D2 and now has, um, look like D1 and it has D1's data. So then the shape index plugin, you'll see here I gave it a shape index of eight. With this example, it's, a, it's quite tricky. With the SVGs, the Vienna, the Vienna piece has very few nodes, whereas the Dublin one has a lot of nodes, which makes it very tricky to make them morph into each other. And often if you try to use this plugin and you try to morph things and it just looks like a mess, it's probably has to do with your shape index. So um, what the shape index does is you can change the node at which the morph originates from. Mm. Is that everything? Yeah. And then you can see at the bottom there, that's where you add in your label and you say when you want the sequence to trigger. So a small um, chart we did, not the nicest, but um, just about how can we animate charts. Um, they're usual, usually hard for websites because how do you make them responsive? And um, this is done using Chartist, a small library. Um, it makes all the charts SVGs, which is nice because then we can animate and change them and it's automatically responsive out of the box. So how can we have this draw effect. Um, no matter if it's a pie chart or a donut chart. Um, we first need to get the, the length of the path, the path is, so we know how long do we need to animate. So each slice, we need to know how long it is. And then we set the dash array to match exactly that length. So it's actually, it's, it's hidden because the, the dash ray property is the space between, if you have a stroke, meaning a line in an SVG, it's the, the space between. So the higher, the more, the higher the distance between those dashes. If it's the same length as the path, the path is actually not shown. And then you animate it from that length down to zero, so it, it draws the line, and that's a drawing effect. Um, and then we define the animation. So the ID we need um, of each slice, so we can sync them, so the second one starts when the first one ended. Um, the duration is duration, how long should that take from two, from where does the animation animate to. And the fill freeze is needed, otherwise the animation would jump back to its initial state and it would not be visible anymore. So we need to freeze it, so it draws the whole circle. Uh, login form, we click it and shaking its head. Um, that's only CSS transform and here's a keyframe, so zero and 100, they don't change at all. On the x-axis, the form stays where it is and then 10, 20, we 
move it minus 10 pixel on one side plus 10 pixel on the other side and back and forth. That's how it's shaking. And then we just tell it to take one second to shake, ease, and move forward, not backwards, the whole animation. An upload button, also entirely CSS, except for the click toggling. Upload it. Hmm. Okay, that's misaligned. Um, maybe the beamer, but so basically we have the button and on um, one side we have a span element that's exactly the size of the button, but it's hidden because we translated X into the minus and the button obviously has an overflow hidden so we don't see it. And then we um, transform it for two seconds, slowly having this progress effect and it moves and fills up the button that we saw. And the cubic bezier is just that it's not linearly but like goes fast and then slows down. Um, yeah, they're actually in code exactly aligned with the button, so don't mind that, just check the code. <laughs> um, so that's the check um, that's drawing itself. It's also using the dash offset to draw. It's an SVG um, path. It takes 1.5 seconds and it's delayed by the amount that the other progress bar takes to fully load, so it only happens afterwards. And then the fill mode, forward linear default, these are default values. Um, and the keyframe, so what it first does, it has the 100, 100 pixels, that means the check mark is hidden, and that goes to zero, so it's drawing itself again, and then we slowly also move it up, and the next element is coming in, which is the uploaded button. So the upload moves up, the check mark is drawn, and then the uploaded moves, which is hidden and translated 100% below the button and delayed four seconds. Yeah, because that's the sum of the progress bar and the check mark, and then it moves up as soon as the check mark is gone. And that uh, Translate 50-50, that's just to vertically and horizontally center the uploaded the text in the button. So animation is often implemented as an afterthought and considered the sugar on top. When it's treated this way, it will feel this way. It's a powerful design tool which can be used to greatly improve the user's experience, but when used incorrectly, it can hinder the user and end up causing an overall unpleasant experience. Motion design should enhance the user's experience and add meaning to a design. It's an important tool that every designer and developer should pay attention to. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the really nice animations. Um, I have a, a silly question because um, do you, uh, you obviously probably receive from the, from the designer a, a document where it's like very detailed explained how animation should work. Um, does it work that way, or do you sometimes invent them on the spot and then suggest to the client that this is better? You mean like how we does it work in the process? You, you do you receive a document where it's like really de in detail, okay, or do you invent this. them yourself? So I've got a bit of experience with this. Um, the designer that I mostly work with, Jason, in the Cape Town office, we often will sit down together and discuss things in great detail and plan things and you know discuss, like, is this possible? Can we do this? How long is it going to take? And yeah, it's, it's part of the process that we go through when we decide upon the animations that we're going to implement. So, so the like, intense communication with you and the designer is essential, I assume? Yes. And how does it work if you work with a large project and your designer sits in a different country? Do you have um, any experience with that? I know there's an application of, uh, called Zoom, which, yeah, no, no, <laughs> which I mean, we use a is lot. A, is it 
possible to 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 work just over over Skype or is is, is being physically together? Uh, yeah, well, at Amazie, we've got a lot of remote developers um, or remote people in general, and I've actually never really experienced any issues working remotely with people. It's very easy to contact someone via Slack or Zoom, and you just discuss. And Thank yeah, you. cool. Hi, the, uh, you talk about the animation with JavaScript. Do you have any recommendation, any library or any anything that you really like to use? Yeah, so personally, <laughs> I'm going to give a very obvious answer. I really like GSAP. Um, GSAP has been performance tested, and um, it performs as well or better than CSS. Obviously, there's instances where you'd prefer to use CSS, but if you're going for JavaScript and you've made that decision, I would definitely recommend GSAP. There's a lot of um, extra libraries on top of um, Tween Max and Timeline Max. Um, yeah, it's incredibly powerful. It's quite easy to use. There's a very large community as well. It's easy to find things out and learn things. How do you handle accessibility? Because you're conveying information through animation um, how do you present that information to visually impaired people? There are a lot of ways which, um, with SVG text, it can still be readable. Um, I don't really quite know how to explain it, but a lot of time when you animate text, there are methods which you can use to um, have the text still be legible and it can be picked up by like text-to-speech editors and things like that. Also, that's that's more when it comes to immersive animation. So the, the sort of subtle things, it's not really going to be affected by that, I don't think. Well, I think if you change a button to the status of uploaded, you will have to inform the user that, mm. you know, the uh, action has resolved. Yeah, well, that was your button. Do you want to explain your... Oh, <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, she... Okay, no, that felt like I was throwing her under the bus. Yeah, this is how we uh, we work together. <laughs> um, but, so Sarah is a designer and developer and all of that. So, and she put a lot of thought into that, that button. We sat together when she was programming it, and I think she spent about, like, seven hours. <laughs> but, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the... Yeah, we changed that button a lot of times and uh, just wanted to make it perfect. Um, so the focus is on um, animations here and the uh, accessibility. I know it's, it's always the thing that we keep forgetting or, or that projects don't have the budget for and it would be important, but... So... In this case, it... yeah. There's not the SVG that you could tag. Um, not sure. Maybe one last comment. I think accessibility should be your first focus because if I'm visually impaired and I cannot use it, I simply cannot use your website. So I would suggest start with accessibility and build on top. I mean, progressive enhancement is still the best way to go. So I really like the uh, uh, animations, but I want to make sure I can use them, especially mm -hmm. for government uh, clients where we have to be accessible. Totally. Uh, hey, thank you for this amazing session. I just have a little query. How do we decide uh, if I have two options for the animation? Uh, what are the criterias on which I can decide which animation, uh, which way I should go, this way or that way? Like, there, there must be some basic criteria, right? Uh, uh, it should be user-friendly, easily accessible, the colors, maybe, and so something like that, maybe. You can do user testing, or usually I design a lot of the things I do in the browser itself, mm -hmm. because only if I see them or I can then um, knock on like get one of the other designers to look at it in my browser and then start discussing and tweaking when's the timing perfect, how much needs this to be delayed or... So is there something like the optimizations as well in, in the animation designing? 
because I'm a back-end developer, I, I really don't know much about the animation design. So does the optimizations part comes in and plays an important role as well? Or it's just that you can design whatever the way you want because I'm starting to learn the animation design in for my own project. This is why I'm asking this. Well, it shouldn't take too long and animation should not be something that the user has to wait for to end because it, it should help but certainly not like prolong anything. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, hmm. Just a quick remark to the accessibility question from you. So it's one thing is the animation and then to show people who are able to see that animation that they can experience it and maybe get an added value. But on the other hand, there are possibilities to add information which are only visible, to, for example, to screen readers. And so this is actually, in my opinion, at least not part of this talk. So let's discuss it <laughs> later. <laughs> I'm just on the topic of optimization. Um, a couple fun facts or things that probably everyone already knows. Um, if you're looking at CSS animations, the sort of the cheapest properties to animate are opacity and transform, I believe. And then with SVG, I always use SVG OMG to optimize my SG, uh, SVGs depending on the complexity of it, because some of them you put it in there and the next thing you know it looks completely different, but SVG OMG has a lot of different settings that you can play with and adjust the precision and yep, usually, I mean, I get about like 60 to 70% saved on my SVGs that way. No more questions? Mm -hmm.